We are now on Chapter 6, Acellular Pathogens, Viruses, Viroids, and Prions. This is an example of one of the earliest known records depicting a viral infection. If you look at the gentleman and look at his legs, he has one leg that is significantly smaller than the other. He's also using a staff to be able to hold himself up and walk. This is thought to be a representation of a gentleman who had polio. And this is from an ancient hieroglyph found inside of a pyramid. These beautiful crystals are from the Cave of Crystals in Mexico. The Cave of Crystals was unintentionally discovered by a mining company, and they believe that these crystals have existed within this cave for thousands of years. There's been great research done on this basically enclosed time capsule that had never been opened until it was discovered. They've done geological studies and they've done microbial studies. Um, when they did the microbial studies, they discovered bacteria within the fluid inclusions of these crystals. They used sterile aseptic techniques and the researchers were able to extract and reanimate these unknown organisms. They have discovered that these organisms, these microorganisms found within these crystals, are not closely related to anything in the known genetic databases that we have. So these microorganisms found within the cave of crystals have been unique, and research continues to discover what they really are. Do you think viruses are alive? A yes, B no. There has been great debate on whether viruses are considered to be alive. If you look at the definition of life, part of that definition includes the ability to be able to reproduce. Remember what's unique about viruses is they have to have a host in order to replicate. They are not able to reproduce on their own. They must have a host cell in order to use that host cell's genetic components in order to replicate its own. So a number of scientists debate whether viruses are really alive because of the fact that they cannot replicate on their own. But what do you think? Do you think viruses should be on the phylogenetic tree of life? A, yes, or B, no? This is another question that you might consider. Again, there's great debate on whether they should be on the phylogenetic tree of life based on the fact that they are not able to replicate on their own and they use a host for replication. But there are scientists that argue that we can understand more about viruses if we do put them on the phylogenetic tree of life. They do have that genetic component. They do have RNA or DNA. So they do have genetics that we can look at. And if we put them on the phylogenetic tree of life, then we can look at the relationships between viruses. We can look at the similarities and the differences. Through my graduate studies, I believe that we should place them on the phylogenetic tree of life because it does help us to understand them better. But there continues to be a lot of debate because, again, viruses are acellular, obligate, intracellular parasites, and they do use a host cell in order to replicate their genetic material. Most viruses are human pathogens. A true, B false. In actuality, most viruses are not 
human pathogens. So this is B, false. We actually have a normal microvirome. We have viruses just like we have bacteria. We have this microbiome of bacteria as well as a microbiome of viruses within our bodies and on our bodies. And like the normal microbiome of bacteria, it helps to protect us. Also, there are a large number of viruses that are predators of bacteria. The bacteriophages that hunt bacteria and kill them also help to protect us, and they help to protect us from pathogens. So the answer here again is false. Most viruses are not human pathogens. In the South, there was great destruction of the tobacco crops in the 1930s. And they looked and looked to find the source of this disease that was destroying vast amounts of crops. Tobacco was a large percentage of the financial wealth of the South in the 1930s. And so they were really wanting to figure out what caused this destruction. Eventually, in 1935, it was discovered that the tobacco mosaic virus was the source of all of this disease that was occurring in the tobacco crops. And this was the very first virus discovered, the tobacco mosaic virus. Viruses contain either DNA or RNA. They also contain a capsid, which is a protein coat that surrounds this genetic material. It surrounds the DNA or the RNA. That is what the virus is made of. There are sometimes other structures associated with viruses. Some viruses can have an envelope, a lipid bilayer that surrounds the capsid. Some don't have an envelope. Some viruses can have spikes for attachment. Some don't have spikes. Some can have like suction cups on the outside. Some don't. Viruses are always acellular, obligate, intracellular parasites. They must have a host to replicate. And for the majority, they are host-specific, which means that the virus will choose a specific type of host and only infect that specific host. They are very uh, particular about what they infect. The host range is determined by the host attachment sites and the cellular factors within that host. If the virus likes the attachment sites, if it likes what that host contains within it, then it selects it and it infects it. Here is the image from your textbook that shows the different sizes of different things so you can compare them. You can see that those virus are at the size of a nanometer. And we know that our compound bright field microscopes in our labs can only see bacteria that is the size of a micron, micron size. We cannot see the nanometer size. We can see viruses through an electron microscope because an electron microscope can see at the level of a nanometer. What I really like about this image is that you can see all the way from a frog egg to an atom and you can kind of get the perspective of what sizes are things. Now there are big viruses. Those are like the pox viruses. They are pretty big and they're pretty close to um, the size of a bacteria, but really not close enough to be able to visualize it with a compound bright field microscope. But if you had an electron microscope or higher, you would be able to visualize viruses. 
Now, viruses have some distinct morphology, just like how bacteria had morphology. Viruses have morphology as well. They can have three different types. They can have a helical morphology, and this morphology is based on the capsid. It can look like a long hollow tube or a long rod shape. It can be polyhedral. It can have triangular faces and be icosahedron. It can have absolutely geometrical angles with corners. It can be complex. The capsid can be a combination of both the helical morphology and the polyhedron morphology. So it's combined. It can be a unique viral structure as well. Here are some images from your textbook on the viral capsid morphology. You can see in A that helical structure, that hollow tube, and that's like the tobacco mosaic virus. Also, Ebola virus has this shape. You can also see that geometrically shaped, the triangular facets of the icosahedral shapes, of the polyhedron uh, shapes of the capsids. You can also have a complex formation of both helical and polyhedron, and that could be something like a bacteriophage. And then you also have kind of a unique combination of it in that um, representation in C. Bacteriophages, or phage, as you might see in your textbook, are viruses that infect bacteria. They are predators of bacteria. Phage means to devour. So you can imagine this bacterial phage coming up to its host cell, this bacteria, and devouring it. You can also see that virus means poison. So you can also imagine this bacteriophage landing on this bacteria host cell and injecting its poison into this host cell that may eventually lyse it and destroy it. They are super cool looking because they do have that polyhedral shape to the capsid on the top. Their viral genome is within that polyhedral shaped capsid. And then it has a long helical hollow tube for a sheath. It also has these tail fibers and additionally spikes. Both the tail fibers and the spikes can be used to attach to these host cells that they find, to the bacteria that they want to infect. A virion is a virus particle. It transports that viral genome. The capsid, again, is a protein coat, and it surrounds the nucleic acid. The capsids are made of individual proteins called capsomers. The virion particle consists of that protein capsid and the nucleic acid. So together they are called a nucleocapsid. Viruses again can have lipid bilayers. They can have an envelope that surrounds this nucleocapsid. When they have a lipid bilayer, an additional layer, and they are enveloped, they are different than those viruses that are considered to be naked viruses. Naked viruses are non-enveloped. They do not have a lipid bilayer around that nucleocapsid. So you can have enveloped viruses and you can have naked viruses. Here is an image uh, representing the naked virus and the enveloped virus. So that top virus does not have an additional lipid bilayer around the nucleocapsid. 
there is no extra layer around it. So it is considered a naked virus. There is no envelope. If you look at the example of the virus at the bottom, this is an enveloped virus. It does have that additional lipid bilayer around the nucleocapsid. What's interesting about naked viruses versus enveloped viruses is you might think that the naked virus would not have as much protection and it would be more susceptible to disinfectants or antibiotics, but this is actually not the case. If you think back to the gram-positive and the gram-negative bacteria, that gram-negative bacteria, remember, had that lipid bilayer. But that lipid bilayer was susceptible to things like alcohol, which could destroy it. The same idea is true of an enveloped virus. An enveloped virus does have that additional layer, but it's a lipid layer that is easily destroyed and easily targeted. It can be destroyed by disinfectants. It can be targeted by antibiotics. It can be disintegrated or holes can be poked into it in order to reach the core of that virus. So actually, it's the naked viruses that are stronger. A naked virus can live on a fomite, such as a table, or something like a door handle for a lot longer than an envelope virus because they do not have that envelope that is susceptible to disinfectants and things like that. Now, some virions are isometric. They have a very symmetric capsid, almost completely round in their appearance. And remember, some viruses can have spikes, which they can use as attachment proteins so that they can attach to their host cell in order to gain entry into that host cell. They can also use these spikes um, as a way to get out of the host cell. Now, if it is an enveloped virus, then the spikes will project from these envelopes. If it is a naked virus, then the spikes will project from the capsid itself. Most bacteriophages have these tailed virions that you saw in a previous picture. Remember, a bacteriophage is a combination of shapes. It can have that isometrical head, that polyhedral faceted type of capsid at the top, and then it can have that hollow helical tube for a tail. When you consider the bacteriophage, its attachment is made at the end of that tail using its spikes. And it's also often mediated by those thin uh, tail fibers that project out the bottom. Here is an image showing that really rounded capsid that it can have, that symmetrical capsid. At the top, you can see that is a naked virus. The spikes are projecting from the capsid. The lower image is of HIV. And HIV does have an envelope. It does have that additional lipid bilayer that is around the capsid. And those spikes project from the envelope itself. Viral taxonomy can be a little bit more complicated than bacterial taxonomy. What you need to know is that viruses can have a family to which they belong in. When the name ends in viridae, that represents the family that those viruses belong to like pox viridae or philo viridae. Those are families that a particular group of viruses will belong to. When the name ends in virus, that is the genus 
of that virus, like Ebola virus or orthopox virus. Those are genuses which can belong to a family, but when it ends in virus, it's genus. When it ends in viridae, it's family. We've talked a little bit about species and we briefly mentioned viral species. Viral species is a group of viruses sharing the same genetic information and the same type of host. And remember, viruses also can have a species de designation then. They can have a family designation, a genus designation, and a species designation. And they can have a subspecies designation. And usually this is a number like H1N1 or H5N1. It is a specific number to identify a subspecies of that virus. Influenza is really known for having many, many different types of subspecies. And all of those unique influenza viruses have a number. The Baltimore system is another way to classify viruses. We can classify viruses based on their genetic material, based on their genomes. Now remember, viruses can be an RNA virus or a DNA virus. So we can classify these viruses based on that. Are they an RNA virus or a DNA virus? Is it single-stranded RNA or a double-stranded RNA? You can classify it based on how many strands it has and whether those strands are a positive strand or a negative strand. Also remember, they can be enveloped or naked and you can also include that in the classification under the Baltimore system. So two examples would look like a double-stranded DNA virus that's enveloped, like pox viridae. Or it can be a positive, single-stranded RNA virus that's naked, like a rhinovirus. Let's look at some different ways that we can grow viruses to study them for research purposes, to develop medications against them. So we can grow bacteriophages in particular on a lawn of bacteria. First, you would take an auger plate and you would make a lawn of bacteria. You would inoculate it all over that plate. You would take E. coli, for example, and spread it very thinly over the entire plate. Then you would incubate it and grow that E. coli, that bacteria. Then, after it has formed this lawn of bacteria, you could introduce a bacteriophage, a virus, to this plate of bacteria. Because bacteriophages are predators of bacteria, they would then kill the bacteria in different spots on that plate. These areas of dead bacteria are called plaques. Within those plaques, though, you would find the bacteriophages growing. So the plaques are dead bacteria. That is true because the bacteriophage is the predator of the bacteria. It finds the bacteria, it kills the bacteria cell, and then it grows. So remember, plaques are areas of dead bacteria, but they are also areas of bacteriophages that are growing. Have you ever received an influenza vaccine? And before you received that vaccine, did the healthcare provider ask you if you were allergic to eggs? This is the reason that we are asked if we are allergic to eggs when we receive the influenza vaccine. We can grow viruses in fertilized chicken eggs. 
We can inoculate the virus into the embryonic membrane compartments of this fertilized chicken egg. We can inject the viruses into the yolk sac. We can inject the viruses into the amniotic sac. All of these different compartments are places where the virus can grow. It can infect the cells within this fertilized chicken egg and grow and develop. And then we can harvest them to make influenza vaccines. But we are not like chickens. And so when that vaccine is developed, it has a component of the chicken egg within it. And so we have to be asked whether we are allergic to eggs because when that virus is injected to us, we are basically injecting chicken egg as well. We can also grow viruses in cell cultures. Cell cultures that were developed using tissues. Because of the CPE effects of a virus, which I will talk about in the next slide, you can develop a continuous cell line where these viruses will continue to replicate continuously and they become immortal and they just continue to develop. And these are called continuous cell lines and they can ma be maintained indefinitely. One of the most well-known cell lines is called the HeLa cells. And in your textbook, there is a story about Henrietta Lacks, and I hope that you will read that section. There is also a book written about her, and I think there was a documentary developed. Henrietta Lacks is a woman who had incurable cervical cancer, and it's very important for you to understand that when she died, her cells were harvested without her knowledge, without her family's knowledge. And the story of Henrietta Lacks is important for you to understand because of the importance for having ethics in healthcare and informed consent. Both of these things became very, very important after the conditions of how these cells were harvested without her or the family's consent and how this came to light. So these cells were harvested from Henrietta Lacks after she died and used for so many different types of research, not just for cancer research, but for Parkinson's and AIDS and all kinds of different types of research these cells could be used for. They were sold to different companies and her, basically her cells were spread throughout the world. And her family never knew. And then when they did find out, they were very, very um, horrified because parts of their mother, they felt, were out in the world without their consent. So thankfully, out of this terrible situation of not asking Henrietta Lacks or her family the importance of having strong ethics and for having informed consent uh, became important in healthcare. And I really hope that you will look into the story of Henrietta Lacks and see the contributions that she made to so many, many areas with her cells that became the HeLa cell line. However, you need to understand that she should have been asked. She should have been able to give that consent. Her family should have been able to give that consent. Yes, she has helped in a lot of different fields of medicine, but to what cost? You need to think about that. These are a few ways that we can identify a virus. We can look at the cytopathic effects. We can look at the CPE that occurs in the host cell when a virus infects it. 
a virus will cause structural changes to that host cell. It can cause cell abnormalities within that host cell. It can cause it to change its shape. The host cell can become more round. It's called the rounding of the cells. It can cause vacuoles to develop within that host cell. It can cause inclusion bodies to occur within that host cell. It can cause the nucleus to shrink in the host cell. It can cause a loss of adherence factors, which means that instead of sticking to something, the host cell will just kind of float around. It can cause syncytia, which is when multiple cells will fuse together. Many of their nuclei, when they do have the nucleus, will be grouped together these it will just be kind of like a glob of cells um, viruses can cause the loss of contact inhibition and what that means is that usually a cell will um, stop growing when it bumps into another cell it helps to control the growth of these cells but when it loses the contact inhibition, then the cells will continue to divide. They don't care if they've bumped into another cell. They will just continue to uncontrollably divide like a cancer cell. They will be transformed into an immortal cell. You can also identify viruses based on serological tests. Remember, we looked at the Western blot. And in a serological test, you can look for the antibodies that have occurred in response to the infection of a virus through using their blood plasma. You can also identify a virus based on their nucleic acid makeup by looking for that genetic material. You can use PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to make more of this virus so that you can research it and research its genetic components, its nucleic acids. Now let's look at the multiplication process of viruses. You need to know this for quizzes and exams. You need to know each of these steps and what is happening in each of these steps. So the first stage is attachment. So the bacteriophage of the virus comes along, it finds its specific host cell, and it wants to infect it. So it has to attach to it. So the bacteriophage or the virus attaches to the host cell. Then it needs to penetrate into that host cell. It needs to somehow either open up the cell wall or force its way in, but it needs to penetrate its genetic material into that host cell. Somehow that genetic material needs to get into that host cell. So the second step, the second stage is penetration. So attachment, then penetration. The third stage is biosynthesis. That's where they use the host's cell machinery and make more of itself. It makes more of its parts. It makes more of its genetic material. It makes more of its protein to form capsids. It makes all of the pieces that it needs to make more of itself. That's what it does in biosynthesis. In maturation, it assembles all of these pieces, all of the pieces it needs to make little whole baby viruses. It assembles all of its things. Then it needs to release. From most host cells, it will kill the host cell. It will lyse the host cell. It uses its lysozymes to destroy the cell wall of that host cell, lyse, and release itself to make more of itself So and to spread throughout the body. So the idea is it must release somehow and usually, usually it's through lysis. 
when that virus lyses the cell in order to be released, that's called the lytic cycle, where cell death of the host occurs upon release. That's the lytic cycle. There is also another life cycle of the virus called the lysogenic cycle. You might see in your textbook the words temperate, temperate phase or temperate cycle. Whatever you see, that's also the same thing as the lysogenic cycle. So the life cycle starts the same. You start out with attachment, the virus or the bacteriophage has to attach to a host cell. Then it has to penetrate its genetic material into the host cell. What's different about the lysogenic cycle is that DNA integrates with the host's genome. It integrates with the host genome and then stops the process. And the host when it replicates, will replicate itself along with this new genome it has with the integrated DNA. So this can occur for a very long time. The phage becomes latent and it is just waiting for a trigger in order to stimulate, in order to activate it to continue its life cycle. But it will continue to replicate along with the host cells because it's integrated into the host's genome. The host cells are known as lysogenic cells when that viral DNA is integrated into its genome. Something will come along, some sort of trigger will occur, and then the viral DNA will activate and separate out of the host genome and the lytic cycle will begin. So these are excellent images from your textbook. The lytic cycle again, you can see that bacteriophage coming along attaching to the bacterial host cell. It then penetrates the host cell, injecting its genetic material into the host cell. Then it makes all the parts it needs. It makes its little protein capsid parts. It makes more of its genetic material. It makes all of the pieces it needs in order to make more little viruses, make more of itself. In maturation is when it puts those parts, puts those pieces together. It assembles all of the viruses from the parts it made in biosynthesis. Then for the last stage, it lyses the host cell. It kills the host cell. And upon the death of the host cell, all these new viruses can be released. Now that lysogenic viral cycle is a little bit different. And remember, sometimes you'll see it as the temperate cycle. So it starts out the same. You have to have that attachment, that bacteriophage, that virus finds its host cell, then it attaches to it. Then it has to do the penetration stage where it injects its DNA somehow into that host cell. Then what's different about the lysogenic cycle is that DNA will incorporate into the host's genome and then it waits. So as those host cells duplicate, as they divide and replicate, they will duplicate the new genome that has the viral DNA incorporated into its genome then something has to activate the DNA to separate out of that genome. There has to be a trigger. There has to be a stimulus for that virus to enter into the lytic cycle. But when it does and when it is activated, the DNA will separate out of that host genome and then begin biosynthesis. 
So then it begins biosynthesis, where it begins to make more of its parts, more of its particles. It needs more capsid parts. It needs its genetic material made. It makes all of these pieces that it needs to make more viruses, more of itself. After it makes all of those, then it goes into the maturation stage where it assembles all of these pieces, all of these parts that it has made. It makes new viruses. It makes a whole bunch more of itself. Then it has to release. So it lyses the cell wall so that it can escape. It needs to destroy and kill that host cell so that it can release. Animal virus multiplication is a little bit different. It has another step that you need to know. And for quizzes and exams, you'll need to know all of these steps and what is happening in each step. So it starts out the same. It has to attach to a host cell. It finds its host cell and it attaches to the outside. Then it penetrates the host cell, which it does in a little bit of a different manner. It can come into the host cell by endocytosis or it can fuse with the cell membrane of the host cell and come in that way as well. The unique step that occurs in animal virus multiplication is uncoding. Because that virus goes into its host cell via endocytosis or fusion with the cell membrane, it ends up having an, a, an extra coat on its genetic material when it enters into the cell. It has an extra membrane on it that it pulled in when it came into the host cell through endocytosis or this fusion. So it has to take off that extra membrane. It has to uncoat the genetic material before it can begin biosynthesis. So uncoating is an unusual step in animal virus multiplication, but it has to be done by the virus in order to get to its genetic material. Once it uncoats, it can begin biosynthesis. It produces more of its genetic material. It produces more of its proteins to form its capsid. Then in maturation, it puts all of those particles, all of those proteins and genetic material together, and it makes more of itself. It makes more little viruses. Then it releases. It can also release in a different manner. It can do what's called budding, where it kind of squirts out of the host cell and takes some of its membrane with it and forms an envelope virus. Or it can release also by lysis. No water. Oh. <clears throat>
You can see in these images taken with an electron microscope, you can see how it can um, get, get into that host cell through endocytosis. It kind of pulls it into the cell. You can also see in the entry of the herpes virus how when it comes in, you can see that extra membrane that's going to be around that virus and that genetic material. So remember, it has to uncoat. It has to take off that extra membrane that it's pulled in and then begin biosynthesis and maturation and then release. What you need to know from this slide on multiplication of a DNA virus is that it can take a while for a DNA virus to incubate and become an infection. It still comes in the same way through attachment and penetration and then that DNA virus will integrate into the host genome. It can enter into that lysogenic cycle. It waits for an activation, but there's many, many steps that uses transcription and reverse transcriptase. There's different things that must occur for a DNA virus to be able to biosynthesize, mature, and eventually release. So there are a lot of things that cause a DNA virus to take a lot longer than an RNA virus to become an infection. You can also see here that a DNA virus can leave the host cell through budding. This is an example of an RNA containing virus showing the multiplication steps of that virus. An RNA virus has the shortest incubation time of the viruses. A positive single-stranded RNA virus can replicate and become an infection within 24 hours compared to a virus that's like a DNA virus that can take like 21 days in an Ebola virus. So there is a difference in how long the incubation time is before a virus becomes an infection. And RNA viruses, what you need to know, are the fastest viruses. And positive single-stranded RNA viruses have far fewer steps from that attachment stage to the release stage and it can become an infection much, much quicker than any other type of virus. The genetic material of an oncogenic virus can become integrated into a host cell's DNA. So think back to that lysogenic cycle. That virus can integrate its DNA into the host genome. These cancer-causing viruses then can integrate into a host cell's genome. And as that host cell replicates, so does that new genome that now has these cancer-causing viral uh, genetic components within it. So an activated oncogene can transform normal cells into cancer-causing cells. And remember when we looked at the cytopathic effects of viruses causing cells to have these abnormal changes? That's what this does. It transforms these cells and they have uncontrolled, increased growth. They lose that contact inhibition. Instead of bumping into another cell and going, oh, I can't grow anymore, when they lose that contact inhibition, they just keep growing and they just keep multiplying. These cells will then have tumor-specific antigens there have been many viral links through research of 
uh, viruses causing cancer. We will look at human papillomavirus, HPV, and its link to cervical cancer in the last third part of the class. But remember, viruses have these links to cancer. They can integrate into a host cell genome and cause it to grow and replicate uncontrollably and replicate this cancer-causing viral genetic components and make more cancer-causing cells and have those CPE effects and cause cancer within a human body. Let's look at two types of viral infections that will make sense when we think about the viral life cycle. So that latent viral infection must make you think of the lysogenic cycle. The virus remains latent. It can be hidden in an asymptomatic host, which means the host may not be having any symptoms at all for days, weeks, months, years. But think of that lysogenic cycle. That virus is incorporated into that genome of that host cell. It's integrated into that host genome and it's just waiting to be activated, to be triggered. That's what a latent viral infection is. You can have herpes virus incorporated into your genome. And it can be there just waiting to be activated. And then you have a beautiful, happy wedding day coming up. And you get this giant cold sore. And you get that because something triggered, perhaps the stress of the wedding, the excitement of the wedding. You were really tired. You didn't get enough sleep. You weren't eating right. And it triggers the herpes virus to go into that lytic cycle before it was latent. It was just waiting. And then it decided to continue its cycle and it became an infective cold sore. Shingles can do the same thing. You can have the chickenpox virus and that DNA from the chickenpox virus integrates into your genome and it's continuing to replicate along with your cells and it's just waiting for your immune system to be at a very low point for you to be under a great deal of stress. Maybe you're pregnant. There's lots of things that can trigger a latent virus to become a lytic infection and go into that cycle. So you have chicken pox and it's integrated into your genome and then something triggers it and shingles will occur. We will talk about both of these, herpes virus and shingles um, in the third part of the class. But what you need to know for this slide are the latent viral infections can remain latent and hidden in an asymptomatic host for a long period of time. Chronic viral infections, or they're sometimes called persistent viral infections, the disease processes occur very slowly over a long period of time. The virus is released in very small, continuous amounts. It's persistent. It's always there. It's at this level where the immune system is unable to eliminate the virus, but it's still there and it's just causing these chronic symptoms and signs to occur over a long period of time. HIV is one of these chronic viral infections. You can be infected with HIV and it can last for years. It will be just slowly being released and your immune system has no way to eliminate this HIV infection. But then after many years, it can become AIDS. And we'll also talk about HIV and AIDS later on. But what you need to know is that chronic viral infections are persistent. The immune system can't eliminate the virus.
Measles is also another one of these chronic viral infections. Um, people might think that, oh, it's just the measles. I'll get the measles. It'll go away. But that's not how the measles virus works. It can stay within your body systems. And it can be slowly, very persistently causing a chronic infection. And then it can reach your brain. It can get past the blood-brain bar barrier. And the measles virus can cause a very serious infection that can become fatal. So these chronic viral infections just remain in your body systems um, slowly replicating very continuously and very persistently. Prions are infectious protein particles. They are acellular. They have no DNA. They have no RNA. They have no capsid. They have no protein coat. They are just little pieces of protein that are infectious and cause often fatal diseases. They are transmitted by an inherited genetic mutation or they can be transmitted through ingestion. You may eat a meat that has been contaminated or undercooked from a cow that has mad cow, and you can uh, have these prion affections occur. You can receive an organ transplant or a blood transfusion or a graft of tissue that contains these prions within it and you can become infected from those prions. They cause these abnormal proteins to accumulate and cause the brain to become all mushy and sponge-like with these little holes. They can kill the brain cells and that's why it can become fatal. Diseases you might have heard of are sheep scrappy, mad cow, or kuru. All of these are caused by prions, these infectious protein particles. Plaques are areas of bacteriophage growth, B, areas of bacterial growth, C, zones of inhibition. Plaques are A, areas of bacteriophage growth. Remember, we can make a lawn of bacteria on an auger plate and introduce viruses or bacteriophages to that plate. They will kill the bacteria that they want to infect. So it can't be B, areas of bacterial growth because the bacteria are dead. Zones of inhibition has to do with something completely different. So it has to be A, areas of bacteriophage growth. They're growing in those dead areas of bacteria. So they are called plaques. Plaques are areas of bacteriophage growth. Let's look at this slide. The virus smallpox is caused by the variola virus, which belongs to the blank orthopox virus and the blank pox viridae. So remember, we're looking for the genus, the family, maybe the species. If you remember, if it ends in virus, that is the genus. If it ends in viridae, that is the family. So it has to be B. The virus smallpox is caused by the variola virus, which belongs to the genus orthopox virus. Virus means genus. And the family pox viridae. If it ends in viridae, it's family. So the answer is B. Which step is unique to the animal virus life cycle? Is it A, penetration, B, uncoating, C, release, D, lysis. 
Well, we know that release can occur by lysis, so it's not C or D. We know that all of the virus life cycles have to have attachment and penetration. So the answer is B. Uncoding is unique to the animal virus life cycle. Remember, it comes into the host cell via endocytosis or fusion with the membrane. It pulls in part of that membrane and it wraps up its genetic material. In order to begin biosynthesis, it has to un coat. It has to take off that membrane layer and uncoat itself so it can get to its genetic material. Uncoating B is unique to the animal virus life cycle. Now these are a couple of things that students often get confused. Remember, a bacteriophage is a virus. I know it has that word back in there like bacteria, but it's a virus. Bacteriophage is a predator of bacteria. It is a virus that is a predator of bacteria. It is not a bacteria. It's a virus. And a plaque is an area of dead bacteria caused by a bacteriophage or a virus. And within those plaques, there will be bacteriophages or viruses growing. But the plaque itself is an area of the dead bacteria. So that's the end of chapter 6.